Hi, this is Sharon Cluck with Mind of Messiah Ministries. We are at mindofmessiah.com is where the website is. That's also where you can find my book, Letting Them Go, Trusting God to Catch Them. So if you have adult children or difficult relationships, you might want to check that book out. I think it would really help you. It's written in a counseling manner. It asks a lot of questions for you to ponder, and it helps you to discover if you're being manipulated or not. Sometimes we just don't realize that or no. So take a look at that. You might find out that it's a real encouragement and a blessing and to help you to weed out some of the things going on in your life that you just can't seem to muddle through. It looks like the mud and can't seem to see the clear sky. So hopefully you'll take a look at that and that'll help. Today we are on the 12th of a series in Angelic Assistance in Spiritual Warfare. I never dreamt that I would have this many teachings on this, but when I opened it up, I opened up a can of worms and I started learning things that I had never seen before myself. So a lot of what I teach you is hot off the, the frying pan because God has taught it to me recently. And as he's teaching me, he's teaching you. We have already prayed before we started this and, and asked for the presence of God and the blessings and the anointing on it. I have a list on the board of different forms of spiritual warfare. Many of them are things that most of us have ever thought about before. We've taught, been taught that spiritual warfare is putting on the whole armor of God. And we look at the whole aspects of the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the, the sash of truth, feet shod with the perspiration, the gospel of peace, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the shield of faith and praying always, as we've talked about it over and over and over and over. Lots of good teachers out there who have taught on that for years. And so if that's where you're going, you can go back and look at some of our teachings that are listed on YouTube. Uh, we have Deliverance 101. That's a really good one. And there's a lot of other ones where we taught on the armor of God. Today, what we're looking at is different aspects of what warfare really is. And so behind me, I have listed some things that we will be talking about. I'm not gonna go over all of them right now. You can see the list. I hope you can make that out on the screen. Uh, those that are here have already made that list, have already copied that. Let's just get started with this. This is the 12th session in a series on angelic assistance and warfare. And during this process of studying about angelic assistance, I have discovered that there are so many modes of warfare that I've never understood before. As a church, We've been learning the sacrificial offerings, or our local congregation has been learning about the sacrificial offerings in the book of Leviticus. And I've seen that even these offerings that were offered up in the tabernacle are a form of warfare. So I'm gonna start there just to give you some groundwork on this. In Leviticus 3.11, it says, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar. Speaking, we're talking about the peace offering. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. So this verse is speaking of the peace offering, and that is a voluntary offering. It's not a sin offering. It's not a guilt offering. It's like a love offering, something that you want to do for God. And it's also the time that you make vows. If you want to make a vow to God, you do that offering as well with the peace offering. So when I looked at this scripture, I found it unusual that it would say that this is the food of the offering made by fire unto Yahweh, because none of the other offerings are called smoke, is not called food. But in this particular scripture, the smoke is called food. It is a food for the altar. So this one says that the smoke that goes up is the food of the offering made by fire unto Yahweh. That word food in this verse is lekim. That's from H3839. It means food, food for man or for beast. Well, God is not man or beast, but this is smoke going up. But it has a deeper meaning. It has a root word that goes more deeply. So in this context, it's clear that this word is one that means bread. It's bread for a man or a beast. But here it is speaking of the smoke being food. God is not eating the sacrifice himself. He's enjoying the sweet smell 
of the burnt offering, which is offered up strictly out of a person's love for him. Hopefully that's how we come to him, that we don't always have a wish list that sometimes we come to him out of love for him. We want to do things to show him our love. So I would think that somehow it smells even sweeter than any other offering to God. So when we look deeper into the word food, it comes from the root word of H3839, which is the root word lekam. It sounds exactly the same way. One is lekam, one is lekam. They sound very similar. This word is a primitive root. It can mean to feed on or by implication. What it's implying is a battle. It means to fight, to overcome, to prevail, to make war and war in. So are the offerings that go up in smoke to Yahweh, are they a form of warfare? What's happening in that process from the time it starts burning and the smoke goes up before Yahweh? What is happening in the spirit? Warfare. So uh, it's pronounced exactly like the word lekem, meaning bread. However, this lekem means something completely different. The root word means by implication to battle as in destruction, to devour. It can mean eat or fight fighting, overcome, to prevail, and to make war or warring. So I read that right from the description, and then I'm reading to you my explanation. So this completely surprised me. As I pondered and I prayed about this, I could easily see that the sacrificial offerings were a form of spiritual warfare. So if that is true, then what the sacrifice means is a form of warfare. So there's more that I was pondering. I could see that other offerings could also be a form of spiritual warfare. The guilt offering and the sin offering both would require repentance from the giver of the offering. And before they would bring their offering to the Lord, they have had to have a pure heart. They've had to get through whatever was between them and God. And they're, trying, they're attempting now to clear that up with this offering. Repentance means to turn from your transgressions and to determine to walk in an obedient way before God again. So every time someone repents, God wins. God wins and Satan loses. What is our salvation experience except repentance? Excuse me, repentance from our transgressions. Turning around and deciding to follow Messiah. That's what happens with the guilt and the sin offering. It's not just to cover what they did, it's to determine that they won't ever do that again. When you see a life for a life or an animal dying in your stead, you have to put your hands on that animal and you see he's going to die in your place. It's blood, it's the blood of the sacrifice where the remission of sin is. It is the blood of Yeshua's sacrifice where the remission of sin is. So. Every time somebody repents, God wins and Satan loses. Not only that, but we've also done teachings on worship is warfare. There's a whole teaching on YouTube here on worship is warfare. So these sacrifices are definitely a form of worship to the one true God. For any of us to have done deliverance, for all of us that are doing or have done deliverance, we know that when we worship and we speak the blood of Jesus, over someone that we're praying for, that that just seems to really get in Satan's craw. He just hates it when we sing, oh, the blood of Jesus, or when we worship, and we just give thanks to God in the middle of that deliverance where we just look up and we say, Father, this is all you. We know we have no authority on our own, but our authority has been given to us through the blood of Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so we acknowledge you as the great king of all the earth, and you are the ruler and greater than any demonic force that is tormenting this person. Therefore, I take the name of Jesus that you've given me to use in power of attorney, and I worshipfully command this thing to come out of this person. When we do the deliverance, you can easily get into a worship situation 
if you're mindful of the presence of God the whole time that you're doing that. If it's true that when we sacrifice that it's a form of warfare, then I could see all kinds of other forms of warfare. So let's look at the guilt offering and the sin offering. They both require repentance. And before you bring your offering, you better have that cleared up before you put things before God. What does he tell us when we come to him to take communion? We're coming to participate, to take part of him. He says, if you got out against a brother, or even if he's got out against you, leave your offering there and come and make it right with me first. Make it right with your brother first. It, it's not only a repentance, it's a restitution. It's making things right with your brother before you come into the presence of God. There are people that have some kind of issue with me from time to time. And I'm awful, all, often wondering, I wonder what I did to offend that person. And when you go to them and you ask them, have I offended you? They always go, no, what are you talking about? And yet, you know, by their actions, that something is not right. That you can't help. But if you take the time to go to that person and make sure then your conscience is clear and you can go back to the Father with your gift and participating in the communion service. Let's think a little bit deeper on this. In the story of Samson, Israel is under great persecution from the Philistines. We did a whole teaching on Samson and how the angel showed up. So I'm not going into a lot of detail on this. I'm only going to remind you of what happened with this. They're under great persecution from the Philistines. And one of the women of the tribe of Dan, she was barren and she was interceding. Interceding is warfare. Interceding is what we're calling intense, fervent prayer. We saw the same thing happen with, with Hannah, the mother of Samuel. But now we're seeing that with the mother of Samson. We see that Israel's being persecuted and the woman of the tribe of Dan was barren and interceding to become pregnant. And the whole nation had prayed for a deliverer. Do you think there was intense fervent prayer there? They're, they're, it's so bad, they're coming in and destroying their crops. So the whole nation's been praying for a deliverer, which is a form of spiritual warfare, I'm sure. And this woman was visited by an angel who told her that not only would she become pregnant, but that her son would be a deliverer for the whole nation just like with Daniel, the angels came in response to her prayer. We see this all the time, that the angels show up in response to your and my prayers. She ran and she told her husband about the visitation and the angel told her that she would have a son and that he was supposed to be a Nazarite. He was not to drink anything intoxicating or to eat anything unclean, but he was, and he was never to cut his hair. And so her husband's name was Manoah, and he had many questions that, that he needed to know. He, was, he had not seen the angel. Uh, he wasn't even sure it was an angel. She wanted to know who, he wanted to know who's this man who came and talked to my wife. So he prays that God would send that man back again. Again, we have answered prayer, an angel showing up through the prayer of Manoah. And so when he prays, the angel does return. So God honors his prayer by, he appears to the woman, the angel appears to the woman again, and she runs to get her husband. Think about this, the angel waits, he waits. They don't have any problem with patience like we do. He waits for Manoah to come to where he is. So why didn't he go back to the, why did he go back to the woman instead of going to her husband? He could have just gone to where Manoah was. It was Manoah's prayer that brought him back. We don't really know. But the angel was kind enough to answer all of Manoah's questions. Manoah had all kinds of questions. You said this and you said that. And you said, so how should, he wants to know, how am I supposed to raise this, this boy? You're telling me he's going to be a deliverer. You know, it's, I have a, a son-in-law who is adopting a child. And he called me today and asked me all kinds of things about parenting. And this is a, a, a child that God has promised through an angel to be the deliverer. And you can see why a father would want to have some questions answered. 
And he wanted him answered by the man or the angel who had come to see his wife. So he comes to Manoah and to Manoah, this angel just looks like a man. That's, he just thinks he's a man. He doesn't realize that this is an angel. And so then let's look to see what happens next. Then Manoah took a young goat. After he talks to the angels, he takes a young goat together with a grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock to the Lord, to Yahweh. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. Here it is. As the flame blazed up from the altar towards heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Oof. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with her faces to the ground. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was an angel of the Lord. I'm thinking if somebody disappears up in the smoke, you might consider that that was a supernatural being. <laughs> and think about this. There is an offering going up and the angel that's there participating in this the angel gets into the flame and the smoke that's going up before the Lord, and he ascends along with the smoke. Seems to me that there's something very sacred about the smoke of this sacrifice. So this is not the only place where this happens. It also happened with Gideon. Israel was being oppressed by the Midianites, and actually I talked to you differently about with, with uh, uh, Samson as the Philistines. I think I did tell you that. Okay, so this one's about Gideon. Israel was being oppressed by the Midianites when Gideon was hiding out in the wine press. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. <laughs> He's going, who? You dog is you. And after some conversation, Gideon wants to make an offering. Well, the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and place it on this rock and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. And then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. So Gideon has not lit the fire yet. He takes the staff, the angel does, and fire flared from the rock consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappears along with the sacrifice. So when Gideon realizes that it was an angel of the Lord, he exclaims, alas, sovereign God, I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And it's so much like Manoah. When the smoke goes up, so does the angel. Both the offerings and the angel disappear at the same time. The Hebrew word for burnt offering actually means to ascend. The actual word, the word for burnt offering, what it means, the phrase burnt offering means to ascend, to go up in smoke. That's what the angels does here. It goes up with the smoke. This, this smoke that goes up is a form of warfare. Here this angel has come to Manoah and his wife and he's promised a deliverer. He has come in response to prayer. This is a, an angel bringing their deliverance. He's bringing this deliverance to Manoah's wife. The child will be born and yet he has to grow up to be strong enough. You know the story of Samson and how strong he was in the things that he did, and he became a deliverer for Israel. So when Gideon realizes that, he's just absolutely blown away. And it's like Manoah, it goes up, and it means ascend in smoke. So with the idea that the smoke of the altar is a form of warfare, I find it extremely interesting that on two occasions that an angel goes up in the smoke with the sacrifice. I'm not trying to build a doctrine out of this, but this is what I have come to understand about what warfare looks like. 
Yes, it is casting out demons. It is binding spirits. It is praying fervently, but it's also repentance. It's sacrifice of any kind to Yahweh. So the time in the word is also warfare. Time in prayer is warfare. Time to sitting and listening to God can be a form of warfare. Speaking the word that the angels take heed to and cause it to come to pass, that's definitely warfare. When we start speaking the word of God, that is warfare. Warfare is worship. Warfare is obedience. Yahweh said, I would rather have obedience than sacrifice. He said that through Samuel. I would much rather have obedience than sacrifice. Sacrifice is power, one way of worshiping God, but obedience is better. It's strong. It's powerful. It gives you authority to walk and use his name through the power of obedience. Warfare is diligently studying to show yourself approved unto God. All of these things will empower us to move in the presence of God. And they bring God's kingdom to earth. All these, all these things that are on this board are opening up the heavens to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. Satan lives on the iniquity of mankind. That's his food. That's his bread. He loves it when you sin iniquity. He has an iniquity force that keeps him going. The stronger the iniquity is, the stronger he becomes. God's kingdom is advanced by righteousness. When righteousness prevails, God's kingdom on earth is expanding. We have that all over the scriptures. It tells us that when uh, lands God is Yahweh, that they prosper. When we worship him and, and, and we are obedient to his word in our country, our land prospers. Look at what it's happening to it. As Satan's iniquity force is building, look what's happening to our nation because of the lack of righteousness, of the lack of obedience. It's being overridden in many areas. Thank God it doesn't have to be overridden in your life and the people around you that you love and you pray for their protection. So the kingdom of God will advance when righteousness prevails and your prayers and your obedience are what is holding back the complete takeover of evil. Think about that. Think about how much power you walk in. Revelations 8, 3, and we're going to read down to 5. And another angel came and he stood at the altar with a gold incense bowl. And he was given a large quantity of incense to add to the prayers of all the God's people. The incense, which causes the prayers to go up in smoke, is a sweet smelling savor to God. It says on verse four, on the gold altar in front of the throne, we learned about the tabernacle and how it was set up. And you remember that you had the Holy of Holies and you had the curtain and right in front of that is the incense altar. That incense always went up right before the throne. It's the same way in heaven. That's where your prayers end up, before God, before his throne, on the incense altar. On the gold altar in front of the throne, the smoke of the incense went up with the prayers of God's people from the hand of the angel before God. So again, we have an angel that's handling our prayers. We don't have any idea what involvement these angelic beings, which are our brothers, our fellow servants, that are taking the word of God and bringing it to pass in the earth. We don't have any idea how powerful they are or what they are doing on our behalf all the time. Verse five, and then the angel took the incense bowl and he filled it with the fire from off the altar and he threw it down on the earth and there followed perils of thunder, voices, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So this is where your prayers are kept, at the altar of incense just before the throne of God. He cherishes your prayers. And look who's in charge of them, but an angel. 
Who's holding them? An angel. They are ministering with us here on earth and they are ministering before the Father and before his throne in heaven. So this verse informs us that the smoke from the burning incense that included the prayers of God's people arose to God. And God delights in the prayers of his people. So quoting from Psalms 34, it's what it tells us that. And then again, in 1 Peter 3.12, it says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. That's why obedience is so important. When you're walking in obedience to God and his kingdom and his commandments, you are seen as righteous before the Lord. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are attended to your prayers. So the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers. And it should encourage us to know that our prayers please God indeed. He invites us to draw near to his throne with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. And that's Hebrews 4.16. That's where our hope comes from. Our hope comes from Yahweh. The tribulation saints will avail themselves of God's invitation to pray. And they will call upon him for grace and mercy. Their prayers and ours ascend to heaven as a sweet smelling perfume. Even Jesus availed himself of the opportunity to pray in times of need. Hebrews 5, 7 reports, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. Listen to how he prayed with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Your reverence and your fear of God makes your prayers heard. His being saved from the death must refer to his resurrection. Jesus did die, but he conquered death by being raised from the grave. He is our example. You who know me and can know that I can barely pray with uh, tears. When you come for our prayer time, I'm, I have to have a box of Kleenex because I'm praying with tears. Jesus was a warrior. He was a perfect example of what warfare and prayer looks like. He was not concerned about anyone hearing what he had to say to his father. And he prayed with loud crying and tears. I shared this once before. I think it's worth sharing again. I grew up in a family that the only prayer that I ever heard was around the kitchen table over meals. And I went to a church and I didn't really hear a lot of prayer. I heard uh, Sunday school lessons and I heard preaching, but I didn't hear a lot of personal prayer. I'd never really heard anyone pray privately. And I was 26 years old when I met my late husband. When we started dating, I would go to his apartment with him and my children. I had two still. And I would kneel down next to his bed with him. And when I heard him praying, I, I was just, uh, I can't even put it in words. I felt like his words were so intimate, how he was talking to God. I felt like I was eavesdropping. Like men. Yeah, I just felt like I felt like I was eavesdropping because his prayers were so personal. And and for one thing, he started thanking God for me and for my kids. And I went, wow, somebody is thanking God for me. Who would thank God for me? Because that's how I saw myself at that time. I I just felt like, wow. That's how people pray. I didn't know how people pray. I had never heard it. I was 26. I had never heard a personal prayer of anyone directly to the Father. And it made me feel like I was eavesdropping. I felt that way this first time I heard somebody praying in tongues too. I, I felt like it was so holy that, oh my God, I'm eavesdropping. I, I shouldn't be listening. This is so holy. But the truth is, is that that's how we're supposed to grow up. We're supposed to grow up hearing our parents praying and making an example for us so that we know what prayer sounds like. So that from a young child, we begin to do more than say our 
comfort. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Never even knew what that meant. That was just a rhyme that I said before I went to bed at night. I had no understanding of, the, of what I was supposed to be doing or that I was actually talking to God. And then when I was 10 years old, I remember having my first intimate conversation with God. And, and I remember praying for somebody who had twins and was having a problem delivering her baby. And my dad asked us all to pray. Well, my dad believed in, in prayer. He believed in God, but we didn't hear it. We didn't hear him pray and we didn't know how to, but I remember asking God for that. And then both those babies were born perfectly natural. And, and I always felt like that was the first prayer that God ever answered in my life. And I was 10 years old. By that time, I should have already been knowing how to do warfare. I should have already been knowing something about Jesus and the blood, but I didn't. I didn't know those things. And we are responsible for the people in our lives for making sure that they know what we know. So in Romans 8, it says that the Holy Spirit within us makes groanings. So Jesus was praying with tears and loud cries, and he's our example. So the Holy Spirit in Romans 8 says he makes groanings that cannot be uttered, but that the Spirit searches the heart. He's the one that searches your heart. We don't know what to pray for many times, but the Holy Spirit within you knows exactly what the mind of the Lord is. And that's why sometimes I just offer myself up. I do this all day long. I just walk through the hallways and I'm praying in the Spirit. I'm praying in tongues because I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit is praying what is the mind of the Father. I don't know. I don't always know what the mind of the Father is. But the Spirit within me does know. And he can make intercession for us. He can be praying for us. He can be praying for our kids. I don't know where people are. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're in danger, but the Holy Spirit knows that. So if I offer myself up to be used of God, to pray in the spirit, to use the, the tongues that he's given me and blessed me with, I always say that speaking in tongues is my saving power. I felt like it was what kept me from a lot of different things. It taught me that he was always in me no matter what. So we don't know how to pray at times with the Holy Spirit within us, always is ready to pray for us. And he knows the will of God for us and for mankind, other people that we pray for. So today we're gonna to look at another angelic response to fervent prayer and the person of Cornelius in the book of Acts. We are going to read the entire chapter of Acts 10. So if you wanna get turned there. All right, we're gonna begin in Acts 10 verse one. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. So this man is over a hundred men. He lives in a part of Philippi. Verse two, he is a devout man and one that fears God. He fears Yahweh with all of his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This is not a Jew. This is a Gentile that knows about God and has a relationship with them. He's devout. He's reverent. He's pious. That's what devout means. He's godly. And now this man's not a Jew, but he's praying to the God of the Hebrews. It says that he feared God, and that is to be in awe of him. He revered him as did everyone in his house. So he had trained his home, like we were just talking about being able to train our children how to pray. He had done that. This would probably include even his servants. So think about this. Not even leaders of the synagogue fit this description. They weren't as, as reverent and fervent as Cornelius, who was not even considered a Hebrew. They believed that their law, the leaders of the synagogue, believed that their laws were higher than the laws of God. But this is a really special man in God's eyes. And he's choosing him out of every man on the earth to take the message of Yeshua to the Gentiles. This is where the door to the Gentiles is opening. Because Cornelius is praying, he's seeking God, and God is going to open up salvation 
through Jesus Christ to the entire world, not just for the Jews. He is the open door for the rest of the world to receive Jesus as their savior. God has his eye on him to the point that it's said that he sends him an angel in response to Cornelius' prayer. And this is what we just read. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. So we can only guess what his prayers were like. But I'm guessing there was something like, oh, to know you more. Oh, to know you more. And it says that he prayed to Yahweh all, always, continually. He backed up his virtue with his works and that he was compassionate to the poor and he gave regularly. He was not a believer in words only, but also in deed. So it appears that he is observing the morning prayers. It tells us he's at the ninth hour. And that that went on every morning in the temple. Same time. That's in verse 3. So in verse 3, it says, he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God. He has a vision, an angel comes. An angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. So the angel appears and he calls him by name. And I get that. When God speaks to me, he always calls my name first. You know, his voice we know, and the voice of a stranger we will not hear. But we're going to see when we get to Peter how he had to really weigh what he heard because it wasn't lining up what he believed. So the angel calls his name, and in verse four, and when he looked on him, he was afraid, and he said, what is it, Lord? And that word means master. It doesn't mean that he thought he was God. He didn't know about Jesus. It, it, he calls him master. And he says unto him, thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. So when Cornelius sees him, he's afraid. In fear, that means alarmed, and maybe even trembling. But he called him Lord. And then the angel gives him instructions. So it wasn't just his prayers that God saw. It was his alms. It was what he was doing. Not just what he was saying, not just his heart, but he was acting out his faith where other people could see. Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father, which is in heaven. That's written in red. Those are the words of Jesus. Verse five, and now send, me to, send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. The angel's giving him instruction. He's lodged with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And he shall tell thee what thou ought to do. So whatever it is you're praying about, this man, Peter, has the answer. And he's going to tell you that you have to do something. So he's gotten instructions, send men there, bring Peter here, do what Peter says. Peter has the answer to what you're asking. So Cornelius has been praying, and God says to send, to, to send for Peter, and he'll tell you what to do. So there must be something that he's going to need to do. Acts 10, 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants. These are devout soldiers of them and waited on him continually. Now, this is scripture. The word tells us that his servants and even his soldiers are devout men. This is a great leader. This is a great man. Cornelius chose, he chooses a household servant and a devout soldier. These are people that have also learned of the one true God. They are in Cornelius' service or else they're living in his house. Verse 8. And when he had declared all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So these people know that for a Jew to have anything to do with a Gentile is not permitted. It's forbidden. But he doesn't argue with the angel. He just does what he's told to do. Remember, this angel came in response to Cornelius' prayers, and he's on a mission for God. This is the opening of the door for the Gentiles. Verse 9, 
On the morrow, as they went on their journey, and they drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. We learned about how the buildings were in the housetops. This was a place like we're talking about um, the upper room. That was the same thing. That was a housetop. That was a presence where people would go for devotionals. So Peter is also praying. And now he's praying at the noon hour, the middle of the day, verse 10. And he became very hungry and he would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. It doesn't say he went to sleep. He went into a trance. This is what that word means. It's G1611. It means a displacement of the mind, like a bewilderment or an amazement. So sometimes that's what it takes to be able to hear God, to hear and speak, is displacing your mind. You got to get all the clutter out to get it to be stayed on the Lord and not on the things around you. But Peter had learned how to do that. He had walked in the presence of Jesus. He had the greatest teacher on how to pray. Verse 11, he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending upon him, unto him. And it had been a, a great sheet knit at the four corners and he let it down to the earth. And I'm thinking, I wonder who's holding this great sheet that's being let down. You think maybe that's an angel? Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. So everything Peter is seeing is what the law says is unclean. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So who's the voice? Is it or is it an angel? Is it somebody doing the will of the Lord? According to the law, Peter is not even supposed to touch these things, much less eat them. Verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. So this word Lord is G2962. It means a, a person who's supreme in authority. The difference is between God, the creator, is G316. So he's not speaking to God, the creator. He's speaking to an angelic being, somebody that's supreme in authority. And the word for God himself is a, a completely different word. And Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And common is what we call things that God considers unclean. So verse 15, and the voice, and it would be nice if it would just say, and Yeshua said, then you would know. But this says the voice spake unto him again, the second time, what God hath cleansed. Now the word is God. He's saying God cleanse these things. That call not thou uncommon. So think about this. We studied about it, where there was a lying spirit that came in the mouth of the prophets. And, and um, if, if a, an angel can come as a lying spirit, it can come as a dream. It can come as a vision. Yeah. It, can, it can come as anything that God wants it to. So before your mind jumps to thinking that this vision is about food that we eat, hold on a few minutes and you'll find out that it's not what God is speaking of at all. Just like the word food for the, the smoke that goes up in the, in the altar is warfare at the root. This is not talking about food at all. And the word interprets the word. It, it, it describes to you what it is talking about. So in Acts 10, 16, this was done thrice. So three times he hears this. And the vessels was received up again into heaven. 17. Now why Peter doubted in himself what this vision, which he had seen, should mean. I can understand that. God's told us in his word that all these things are unclean. Not to touch them. Not to eat them. And now he's got a voice, what seems to be from heaven, saying, yeah, you're supposed to kill them and eat them. Well, what does all that mean? 
So the men, which were sent from uh, Cornelius, had made inquiry for si at Simon's house and they stood before the gate. So well, if Peter, if I were Peter, I would be wondering the same thing. He was full of doubt that the vision even came from God. It, it just didn't line up with the word. And that's how we're supposed to judge things is by the word. It must have been very troubling that God didn't give this dream to any of the other disciples. He specifically chose Peter. Verse 18, and he called and he said, whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were, lo were lodging there. So these people came and they want to know, is Simon here? And, and 19, and while Peter thought on the vision, he's still on the roof. He forgets he's hungry. He's up there and he's pondering this vision. Oh my God, what's this mean? And the spirit now speaks to him and he says, there's three men that are seeking you. So now when he goes down and finds out that that word's true, now he's got to really judge this word that came because he just heard something that he could prove immediately is true. Then maybe what he saw in the vision is true too. Got to be a lot working through here. So arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing for I have sent them. So what if Peter would not have listened to him? There's a lot of what ifs here. But, you know, I think about Peter's personality, and I think God knew exactly who to give that vision to. So the Spirit is saying to him, don't doubt. God knows when you're doubting. Wow. How hard was that? Verse 21. And then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and he said, behold, I am he that you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are to come? And he said, that's what they said to him. Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, well, not just anybody, and one that fears God. And he has good report among all the nations of the, everybody knows about this guy. He has a good report everywhere. He was warned from God by an holy angel. So he's being warned. This is a warning by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear the words of thee. And then Peter, so they present to Peter, who has sent them, that it's a really good guy, and that they know that Peter has a message for Cornelius. So think about this. How would they have known where Peter was if the angel wouldn't have told them? And have telephones. We didn't know where people's whereabouts were. We didn't have even a mail service. How were we even, you, you had to write a scroll and send it by horseback to get to the king. The average person didn't have those things, but the angel knew exactly where he was. And here they were standing out front. They had to have been told where he was. Think about that even with the, with the um, shepherds in the field. It was an angel that told them where Jesus was, tells them. So they present to Peter who has sent them. Then called he them in, this is 23. He's going to bring him into his house. We've all been taught about the threshold covenant. The Gentile's not supposed to cross that covenant, that threshold of a Hebrew, of a Jew. But he brings them into the house. He lodges them overnight. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brother of Joppa accompanied him. It's a really good thing that he had witnesses. He lodged them. It's huge. And when he leaves to go, he invites other brethren, and it's really good that he's got witnesses. Acts 10, 24. And on the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them. So Cornelius knows this is going to happen. He could have been wondering, I wonder if this guy will come. And he called together his kinsmen and near friends. And Cornelius doesn't have any doubt about Peter coming. He gathers everyone that he can, and the ones that he thinks knows God. And so Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and he fell down at his feet and he worshiped him. It's the same kind of thing that happened with John on the Isle of Patmos. He doesn't know who Peter is, but God has sent him. He doesn't know why Peter's coming. He just knows this is the one the angel said to send for. Verse 26, but Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself am a man just like you. 
So I'm sure Cornelius didn't know what to do. He's honored that Peter has come. He knows that for a Jew to be in his home is strictly forbidden. And then in verse 27, and as he talked with him, he went in and he found many that were come together. And he said unto them, you know how that it is unlawful, it's an unlawful thing for a man that's a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man unclean or common. It's not talking about food. That's amazing. It's talking about men. It's talking about a doorway for the Gentiles, not talking about food. Here's a key verse for all the people who think Peter was told it was okay to do away with the food restrictions given by God. I should not call any man common or unclean. 29, therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, I didn't ask you to pay my way, as soon as I was sent for, I asked therefore for what intent you had sent me. So he comes immediately without dispute. That means he's not without gainsaying means that not spoken against. He didn't, he didn't speak against it. You know, he wondered, he doubted, but he knew better than to speak against something God was doing. That's how we take a thought and say it. We don't say things that we don't know are from God. Verse 30, and Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting. So he's not only praying, this is a fasting man, also a form of warfare, which could go on the board easily. Until this hour, and at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. So now we know that Cornelius was not only praying, but he was also fasting. And he is like Daniel. He's fasting to get an answer. What was his question? Verse 31. And said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. That's what the angel said. And thine alms are, had been in remembrance in the sight of God. God is watching you. He knows what you're willing to do and what you weren't willing to do. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodged in the house Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who when he comes shall speak unto thee. So the angel knew exactly where he would be and what he would speak. He was able to tell Cornelius exactly the whereabouts of where Peter was located. And we talked about that. There's no way that he could know that without divine intervention. Think of all the detail that went into arranging this meeting. Everything came together exactly as the angel had told Cornelius that it would. 30, 33. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here? We're here. We're waiting. We're present. We've been waiting for you to come just like they were waiting for the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. These people are anticipating the coming of the Spirit of God that somebody is coming to tell them about. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God. We're here before God because he, he ordained it to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. And Peter opened his mouth and he said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. That's where this phrase comes from. He understands now that there are no respecter of persons. It's a famous line. The door is being thrown open to the Gentiles. Jesus said this, I have sheep of another fold that you know not of. We were about to find out what he meant. Verse 35, but in every nation, he that fears him and worketh righteousness is accepted of him. Look at that verse. In every nation, he that fears God and worketh righteousness. You can't go around saying you fear God and do unrighteousness and be accepted of God. 
We don't complain because they took away our right to have an abortion and call yourself a Christian. He says, he that fears God, who works righteousness and is accepted of God. I got teary-eyed as I read this last night. Think of the magnitude of this. We not only have to fear him, but we are required to work righteousness. To do so makes us acceptable to God. Verse 35, 36, I'm sorry. And the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. They're just now finding out about Jesus. 37, that word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. They didn't even know about the Holy Ghost before. He's anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He has power over the devil. We see that in his whole ministry, people are amazed. This man doesn't speak like all the, the uh, rabbis or the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the leaders of the synagogue. He speaks differently. He has power over demons. He takes care of people that are oppressed by the devil. Verse 39, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and they hanged him on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and then he showed himself openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God even us. He's saying we were chosen. Those of us who saw him, he, didn't, he wasn't going to come show himself to the whole world, but he had chosen people that he showed himself to. That's what he's doing today too. He's chosen you and he's showing himself to you every day. So before God and even us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead, we sat down and we had a meal with him. He came to the seaside and he had fish frying for us. We ate with him. We saw him. We saw him after the crucifixion. After his death, he rose again on the third day. Acts 10, 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Yeshua is the judge of the quick and the dead. To him gave all the prophets witness. Everything written in the Torah and the prophets, it's all about Jesus. It all points to him. And that through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive remission of your sins. They're, they're blotted out. They're not covered over. They're blotted out. He is the one that we have been waiting for. He is the one that is written in the book. Through him, we have our sins forgiven. That's what Peter's telling them. Verse 44, while Peter's yet speaking these words, he doesn't even give an invitation, folks. He doesn't say, do you believe me? While he's still speaking, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. So everybody that heard the word, the Holy Spirit falls on them. You hear and then you receive. And verse 45, this is a biggie. And them, they, of the circumcision, which believed, they were astounded. So you've got people, circumcised Jews, and be keeping Torah, hanging out in the synagogue, keeping all the feast. They expected God to come to them. They didn't expect Jesus to come to the Gentiles. They're astounded. Why are they astounded? They can hear the gift of the Holy Spirit. They can hear these people speaking in tongues. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles had poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Peter has brought men along that were of the circumcision, and I'm sure that that was a huge surprise to them. They were the ones that were insisting that circumcision was required. But how can this be? Uncircumcised men right in front of them, seeing it with their own eyes and their women have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues. They thought that was a gift reserved only for the circumcised Jews. What a day, what a day. Verse 46, and they heard them speak in tongues. I'm not making this up. Those are the actual words. They heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter. So let me tell you what they're doing. This doesn't say they're prophesying. Not all tongues is for prophesying. They are magnifying God. They're praying in a language and they are praying. The Bible says it's the tongues of men and angels. How do we know he didn't get the same language as the angel that came to see him and that they were speaking that language? How do we know when we're praying in tongues that we're not having a conversation with angels? We don't know that. But they're amazed because they heard them speak in tongues, which they thought was only for them, and they're magnifying God. And so Peter answers, and he says, can any man forbid water? Is there any one of you guys around here that just saw this, the same thing? I, can, we, can we say they can't be baptized? Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So he's like, he's saying, you want proof of the vision that God gave me? Well, here it is. Even before they were baptized in the name of Jesus, they are filled with the Holy Ghost. So people that tell you you can't have that until after you're baptized have to read the scriptures. There is no hesitation here. Both Cornelius and Peter have had a heavenly visitation. That is unexplainable. These people were ready to receive the truth with no reserve. No one had to tell them to give the Holy Spirit their voice. No one had to teach them. We didn't say, oh, make an utterance, give it voice. So nobody said, follow me or pray like me. This simply is a power of the Holy Ghost. He falls on them. Their hearts are ready to receive. And they're saying to God, I pray because whatever God has for me, I want it. And so the Holy Spirit fell, freely given by God and freely received by the new Gentile believers. Acts 10, 48. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So he stays to baptize them and they beg him to stay. That's what the word prayed him to stay. He stays longer. When the other disciples hear of what's happened, it's like, Lucy, you got some splaining to do. Because they want to go, what did you just do? You just went to the unclean people. You told them about Jesus. They got the gift of the Holy Spirit just like us. You got some splaining to do, Peter. <laughs> That's why they had the council at Jerusalem in Acts 15, because they had some splaining to do. So brave of him to do that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you can die for doing that. It, Back then, it was amazing. It, yeah. When the other disciples hear what's happening, they want to know, you better explain this. And that happens in the next chapter. So there's no question that the Gentiles had received the gift of the Holy Spirit because they had heard them speak in tongues. To them, that was proof enough. So let's recap. What is warfare? Well, it's fervent prayer. We heard that Jesus prays with loud groanings, that he prayed with tears. It can be loud cries like Jesus did. It can be fasting denying ourselves so we can hear the voice of God. It can be acts of kindness as an outflow of our fear and the awe that we have of God, which is manifestation of his character within you. When you do righteous acts, it's the character of God within you. It's being manifest. It can be obedience to his word, healing the sick. All of these things are forms of warfare. 
You're not doing any of these without the power of God behind you, without taking authority that he gave you. All of these things are a form of warfare. It can be casting out demons, obedience to his word, healing the sick, binding spirits, offering up sacrifices. It can be repentance and it can be worship. In all of these things, Jesus is exalted. In all of them, he wins. His kingdom is established on earth. And in every single one of these things, Satan is defeated. In every one of these areas, this is a form of warfare. And we never saw that before. At least I didn't. So to me, this has been a paradigm shift. This whole learning experience has been a paradigm shift. I see spiritual warfare in a totally different way than I ever have before. Different than my old understanding of Ephesians 5 and the armor of God. And there is so much more to warfare than what I understood before this series. So when we teach, the Bible tells us to be not many teachers because greater is your condemnation. You better live what you teach. You think I don't think about that all the time? I am not trying to introduce something new here. I'm just trying to have your eyes open to the old, to what's already there. Warfare is fighting the spirit of evil, the spirit of iniquity that feeds Satan, and doing it in this earth, that is warfare. And we can do that in many different ways besides having a deliverance service. We are chosen children of the most high, more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. The CJB says we are super conquerors for those of us that love Christ. I hope that this has opened your eyes in a sense, in a way that, that it has for me. I always feel like when I get done that I haven't done the justice to the word that I saw, but I pray that it seeps deep into your heart and that it changes who you are and that you will see warfare different from here on out. Father, I praise you and I thank you for this word. I thank you for those who come to hear. I thank you for those that just pull the word out of you. Hey God, I'm just a, a humble servant and I thank you that you use my mouth, that you speak to me, that you teach me, that you give me understanding because you're the greatest teacher in the whole wide world. There is none like you. The word says, oh Lord God, there's none like you in the heaven. There's none like you in the earth. None but the God of Israel. Father, we thank you for grafting us in. We thank you that as Gentiles, we have a way to the Father through your son, Yeshua, and through his blood sacrifice for us, that we have been invited, that we have been included, and that we said yes. We thank you that we're alive at this time, and that we can know you, and we can know you intimately, and we can learn of you day, day by day. We bless you, and we bless those that hear in the name of Yeshua. Amen. If you learned, and if you like it, please give us a thumbs up. Share, please, and subscribe, and we'll see you again next week. Bless you all.